how you doing? I'm glad that you have come here. If you happen to have come here on purpose or you stumbled across the word church, we're glad that you're here because we know every word matters. I'm excited to introduce to you this summer word series at the movies. Yes at the movies where we actually look at movies we look at their titles we look at the storylines the plots the characters and go behind and see exactly what god is saying to us now take a seat go and get you some popcorn if you need it and get prepared to hear this sunday's message already in progress god bless you our summer word series is at the movies at the movies if you're watching online share share this and and maybe start a watch party man just you know let's just have a great time in the law at the movies we started off with the lion king i went this weekend to go see the lion king i previewed it for baylor I'm, I'm, i'll take her now because i needed to go see it first you know just make sure it wasn't no you know no no scenes that she shouldn't see you know um it's a pretty good movie, pretty good movie. Um, you know, my message about it was better than the actual movie, but you know, uh, watch my message and then go see the movie. It'll bless your life. Last week, we talked about The Upside, uh, the movie with Kevin Hart. Um, and we found that even in, in our most down seasons, there is an upside. I really wanted to launch this series with this message that we're going to preach today. And um, Lady J was kind of, you know, why? You know, that's a scary movie. I don't wanna, you know. <laughs> she don't like scary movies. Uh, she don't like boxing, she don't like MMA. She don't like, you know, anything, anything that has any type of, you know, violence or anything. But this movie really wasn't scary. It was more suspenseful. It was more of a thriller, but it wasn't, it wasn't scary. Um, even when we were at home and I'm, I'm sitting at home and I'm trying to, to screen it, you know, you know, I told you all doing at the movies, this is the only time I really get a chance to watch TV. Um, you know, I'm watching the movie, you know, and you know, she gets her, uh, uh. <laughs> just out of nowhere. Ain't nobody even saying that to her, uh, uh. What? So she goes upstairs and she turned the TV on. She put it on church, say she need to clean out her spirit. <laughs> then I turn the TV up, I get the TV loud. And then she get her louder. Then I say, oh, I get it real loud. <laughs> and I say, don't make me come up there and unplug that TV. She came downstairs looking around that corner. I'm like, all right, baby, I'm gonna turn it down. I'm <laughs> Brothers, I told y'all, man, I love the word church, man. We got real men here, so I'm gonna give y'all a tip. Happy wife, happy life. That's what's up right there. Ladies, you can appreciate that. Brothers, take my word for it. Some battles, I know it belong to the Lord, but you. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I couldn't really find a not so suspenseful trailer. So I'm just gonna talk about the movie and then we'll, we'll get into the message. Um, because we have an amazing kids world here and um, amen. And some of you, all of you may be worshiping with us for the first time. You know, maybe you don't know about our kids world or maybe, you know, I don't trust the people with my kids. We do thorough background checks. Um, fingerprints, I'm talking about like we do background check checks. You know, we send people letters, say, hey, them folks looking for you. Uh, <laughs> so you're, you're, you can feel comfortable in knowing that your children are safe here. Um, but you know, possibly, you know, you may have your children in here. So I did want to make sure that I, you know, didn't put an image in their head that they went home and, you know, they were afraid. You know, now if you're a grown person in here and you talking about being scared and you, I mean, Pastor Jay, I gotta go home sleep with my nightlight on. And? That's between you and your nightlight. But us. Um, so I'm gonna give you the synopsis of the movie. Us. There is, um, let me, let, me, let me see this picture. You have this beautiful uh, Cosby-ish family. 
um, blackish family, um, that this lady, this character on the ends, played by Lupita, um, she was once a child, and her parents, as a matter of fact, it was in 1986, her parents took her um, to this carnival, and her dad, you know, her mom left to go to the restroom, whatever, and her dad was supposed to be watching her. You know how some men are, you know, watch, watch, watch your baby. And, you know, he playing a game, and the baby just wanders away. And so she wanders into this, this, have you ever been to the carnival and they have those, those mirror things? And so she go into the, to the, to the, to the mirror thing and she ends up not seeing her reflection, but she encounters what's called a doppelganger that doppelganger actually means um, a variation, a live variation of yourself. Have you ever heard that everybody has a twin? Mm -hmm. Today you're gonna find out that your twin is closer to you than you think. She was so afraid because she's looking in this mirror, and it's not a mirror. She's looking at another version of herself. She smiled and the other, it didn't smile. She runs away frantic and her father gets her and she's left unable to speak. Fast forward, we get to this place She's kind of come back to herself. She's grown up. She's had children. She went through. She had counseling. And, and I say this all the time. Um, and I know in some church experiences, we kind of frown away from it. But I'm, 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 I'm actually a supporter of getting in a place where you can, you can talk about what you're going through. It's okay. Some of you all may have it with your work with your plan, with your, with your insurance, where you can actually go get some time away where you can talk and just process some things. Now I am kind of, you know, I'm not really on the side of the medication. And the reason why I say that is because I believe that the medication is really only reacting to what your mind is telling it to do. How is that, Pastor Jay? Well, you're taking a leave when your head hurts. Taking a leave when your back hurt. You're taking a leave when you stubbed your toe. Taking the same pill, swallowing it, and it rests in your stomach. Yet, when your head was hurting, it didn't affect your back. And when your back was hurting, it didn't affect your head. It's kind of too deep, huh? Okay. Your mind gave it permission to do what you could have done yourself. The body is designed to heal itself. No, it's kind of heavy, so let me pull out of that. She's now on the other side of what happened, and her husband wants to go back to this place. She really don't want to go because she has distanced herself from it. And as long as she does not have to encounter it, she within herself believes that she's healed. And some of us, that's how we have handled traumatic experiences in our lives. We just try to get as far away from it as we can so we won't have to deal with it. But sometimes them things so sneaky, they'll come and find out where you are. And tap you on your shoulder and say, surprise. <laughs> or to show you how crazy life is, the thing that you were running from, it'll be the very thing that your child has to struggle with. Talk about it. So she's married to this guy, Gabe. Have a daughter named Zora. 
And they have a son named Jason. Nice American dream. They live in this nice house. They're in this house, which is their vacation property. They got money. You know, it's one thing to go on vacation, but to have vacation property, that's a totally different thing entirely. They're in the house because they were at the beach earlier, and the little son, Jason, he's being a child, he runs away, and the mother, as they were talking and laughing, she has a flashback, and she sees that Jason is not there, so she panics, and she wants to leave, because in her head, what happened before is about to happen again. So they rush and they get home, and he's trying to downplay it. Girl, man, that happened a long time ago. Everybody's here. Everybody's safe. Stop acting like that. Let me be honest with you. Sometimes the people that you are attached to will never be able to appreciate what it takes for you to deal with what happened to you. There's a shadowy group that comes down to their driveway. And the daddy himself opens the door with a bat in his hand. This ain't what you want. You know, he's telling them, you know, go on, go on, get from Ryan here. You know, he thought that bat was going to scare him and it really didn't do too much. <laughs> it frustrated them. And they charged the door. And they broke in. It was so confusing that the family saw these home invaders and it was an eerie resemblance to themselves. This is the picture that they saw in their house. Us, the movie Us, is actually a movie about the duality of human nature. That inside of us, there is another us that we try to keep on the low. And many of us live our lives battling our mirror images and many of us don't even want that us to be exposed. We don't want to take a hard look in the mirror because some of us have suppressed things that happened in our lives for so long. The things that happened as a child that you tried to tell adults and they told you to be quiet. The bullying that you experienced growing up the heartbreaks that you experienced after you gave your life to somebody and they didn't know how to properly handle yours. That moment as a man where you felt like you couldn't do anything right and you always felt that you were destined to do something wrong. And you don't want to look at that image in the mirror because if you look at that image in the mirror, you're going to have to deal with some stuff that you wish that you can forget. This particular movie is showing that it does not matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter if you got a wholesome family. It doesn't matter if you are degreed or not. They were on the other side of the track. If you know it or not, if you've seen the movie or not, even their kids, they were so disconnected from their culture. There was a Oh, Negro spiritual that was playing in the background. It's, uh, I got five on it. <laughs> now, I don't know what the five is on, but <laughs> they had it on it. You know, five dollars go a long way. Five dollars get your chicken. Five dollars get your pizza. Yeah. Now, wherever your mind went, I pray that you be delivered from... 
whatever you're putting your five on. <laughs> and so as they heard the song, even the mother was like, here, here, come on, get on beat. Ah, ah. They had been separated. And they felt like if I can just get them away from, from what I grew up in, everything would be all right. Let me bless somebody real quick. It don't matter what community you run to. You go to all the lands, the woodland, sugar land, pear land, mire land. If you don't deal with that issue, it's going to follow you wherever you go. This was the statement that was made by Jordan Peele, the director of the movie. He said this in Entertainment Weekly. He said, there's even a duality in the scissors. He said that if you look at the scissors, while the scissors is whole, it's attached to another part. And without that other part, it would not exist. Over the last couple of weeks, as I talked about Lion King and I talked about the upside, I looked at lessons from the movie. Well, today, I don't want to necessarily look at a lesson from the movie because I saw a lesson in the Bible. Because sometimes, I mean, especially this particular topic, if I start talking about this duality, because even if you look at individual, the word dual is in the middle of individu, so there is even two in individual. There was a man by the name of Paul, he understood this all too well, because we read a text in the seventh chapter of of, of Romans and he's in a very interesting spot. Paul says, the moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. He said, I, I, I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Can you see what I see? He says, I truly delight in God's command, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me Parts of me covertly rebel, and when I least expect it, they take charge. This man is suggesting that while I am whole, I am dual. There are two things inside of me that's attempting to run at the same time. Mm hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad and I, I pray those that are online are still online and if you're online and you hadn't shared this with nobody, share it. Because I really want to kind of come against this thought process that the church has force fed us over years. That the church has kind of made us feel the day that you walk down the aisle and you give the preacher your hand and you give God your heart that everything just supposed to be brand new. The little bag that you got Saturday night is still in your ashtray when you leave out of the church. When I walk down this aisle, it's just me telling God I can't handle this by myself any longer. It does not necessarily mean that as soon as I come down, I go clean, uh, 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 clean as a whistle or uh, cold turkey. It's saying that I have identified that I need some help. And because of that notion, we have people that won't come to church because they say, I'm going to come to church whenever I get my life right. I ain't going to play with God. Man, well, you might well go and die. Because if I can be honest with you, this particular text, and if you don't know who Paul was, you know, those of us who went to Sunday school at least three times. Hey, went to a vacation Bible school, vacation Bible school. You remember vacation, VBS, you know, you color and make the little macaroni plates. And Father Abraham had many sons, many sons. Come on, you've been there. You know, you know, you know. You know that this man wasn't originally born Paul. He was born Saul. 
and he was born Saul and he was an astute guy. He was very intelligent, very smart. He was one of the contemporaries of Socrates. He had this type of knowledge. He wasn't just somebody that was just getting up every morning going to kill the church because he worked for the Sanhedrin Council. Matter of fact, as a kid, he was exposed to being a mercenary because Stephen was one of the first men that were martyred in the, in the Acts church and Saul was there holding Stephen's clothes as he saw them stone him and one day the Bible said that he was on the road to Damascus he had he had a job he was going to go and persecute the church and when he was on his way there was a light that shined down from heaven knocked him off his beast and said Saul Saul why persecutest thou me the light was so bright it knocked him off his beast and he had scales on his eyes he couldn't see and he had to be led down straight street and he gets to this man's house this man laid hands on him and he released the scales on his eyes and then God said excuse me Jesus told him that rather than you going and fighting against the church why don't you keep that same energy and fight for the church and that day he is converted from Saul to Paul he now has an assignment rather than killing people because they say Jesus he's trying to give life to people so they can find Jesus this is the Paul that is having this moment but can I bless somebody real quick he's having this moment in Romans chapter 7 and this wasn't two weeks after his conversion this wasn't two years after his conversion this was 22 years to the date after he had been knocked off of his beast and he is still saying I have been to church for 22 years straight I've sung in the choir for 22 years straight I have read scriptures for 22 years straight I have prayed for 22 years straight I have fasted for 22 years straight but there's still some days that I have moments when I want to do right and evil is always present don't get in this church acting like you ain't never had a moment say when I least expect it that thing that I have been trying to hide that thing that I have been trying to suppress it takes over me he says I've tried everything and nothing helps I'm at the end of my rope is there no one who can do anything for me isn't that the real question the brother had an issue. This was in Romans chapter 7. But as crazy as it is, while it seemed like he may be bipolar or having a schizophrenic experience, we get to the very next page and he's saying, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't. Life can't. The angels won't. All of the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow are where we are. High above the sky or in the deepest ocean. Nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God demonstrated by our Lord Jesus Christ when he died for us. Paul was saying I had a temporary lapse in chapter 7 but in the middle of 7 to 8 I still remembered I had a moment but I still was called to ministry. Who am I talking to in here? I had a moment where I messed up but he still has an assignment on my life. I'm talking to somebody in here who you packed your bags up and left because you messed up and the church had the nerve enough to look down at you and wanted to get you to embarrass yourself and ask for forgiveness from some joker that needed forgiveness themselves. God is saying today, even though you messed up, there's still a need for you in the kingdom. You're not perfect but I need you to understand that there is one that is perfect and he wants you back just as you are. Hallelujah. He wants you back. He wants you back just as, as you are. So today, I want to talk about dealing with the enemy that's my enemy. Dealing with the enemy that's my enemy. And I want to be honest with you. We're not just going to reduce this to sin because Paul said... I desire to do good. I know what I'm supposed to do. 
but evil is always there. The Bible tells you don't be afraid, right? I know not to be afraid because the Bible said don't be afraid. But I still let fear win. That's an enemy inside of me. The Bible told me don't take no thought about tomorrow. But I'm still having anxiety attacks. That's an enemy within me. The Bible tells me to forget what happened yesterday. Yet I am taking depression pills. I've said this. My definition for depression is wishing that you could fix something that is already out of your hand. You're not depressed about the future. Who in here is depressed about tomorrow? You ain't got to tomorrow yet. You're depressed about what happened yesterday. The Bible talks about being gluttonous. But still, some of us, we should be banned out of, out of the buffets. I'm going to get my money's worth. Man, that plate was $10. If you don't put that biscuit down. Just make yourself sick. So I want to deal with the, and we're not going to run past sin, but I don't want to just limit it to that. Because what we did in the church I grew up in, we identified about five sins, put them on the wall. Don't sleep with nobody. Don't take nobody money. Uh, don't, don't touch little kids. Um, what'd they say? Um, they even talked about um, you can't be homosexual, can't be lesbian. And they, they put all this stuff on the wall. And then they would point these out every time they thought they saw somebody that looked like these things. And they, they, they missed manipulation. Because I don't really have time. Y'all only gave me 30 minutes. I only got 10 minutes left of that 30. So I don't have time to really dig into it. But the first level of witchcraft is mind control. So a whole bunch of these preachers and, and pa oh, Okay, let me. Uh, you can't cast a witch out when you're a warlock. Um, dealing with the inner me. That's my... <laughs> It's too much on a Sunday, man. Let me, let me pull back. So how do I deal with it? And the reason why I say dealing, I put I-N-G on there is because it is a continual process. Because some of us, we got to deal with it today, tomorrow, next week. Some of us, we have to deal with it certain times when we see certain people. You know what I'm saying? It's good as long as you don't cross your path, you know, but you know, at certain times of the year, you have to see so-and-so when it's time for school supplies. What you expect me to do with this? I, you want me to buy one shoe for him this? So dealing, dealing with the inner me, that's my enemy, I must. You see how I hit the U and the S, red? Come on now, come on, you see that? <laughs> dealing with the inner me, that's my enemy, I must confront it so I can combat it. Who are you hiding it from? It's yours. I ain't asking you to come and tell us. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm cool with, you know, you know, the, the, the Pope and the, and the you know, and the, the, the fathers and the, the, you know, I'm cool, you know, but this ain't Catholicism. I'm not going to be sitting behind no curtain and you coming to, you know, Father, Father Jay. <laughs> Father Jay, I have sinned. I'm going to come around that corner if you don't get up and go pray to God. Huh? It. I must. I must confront it so I can combat it. Prior to Paul giving, giving that scripture at the bottom saying, man, it's something inside of me that's controlling me. He at least identified that it was something there. He didn't act like it wasn't there. He didn't blame it on nobody else. 
You know, I grew up in the house and my daddy wasn't here. Uh, my mama, she was competing with me. She didn't know how to accept my creativity. My mama wanted purple finger wave just like me. And we live this life where we're pointing finger. The teachers don't like me. Everybody at my job, they know that I'm, I'm superior and they don't want to give me an opportunity. And we spend all of our time pointing fingers at everybody else. You're saying that it's their fault why you didn't get the promotion, but you ain't been to work on time since you got the job. I didn't have a daddy so I don't know how to be a daddy well stop making babies look at what Paul said he said I can excuse me I can anticipate the response that is coming I I can anticipate the response that is coming I know that all God's commands are spiritual but I'm not isn't this also your experience yes I'm full of myself after all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more for I. I know the law but still can't keep it and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions I obviously need help I realize that I don't have what it takes I can will it but I can't do it I decide to do good but I don't really do it I go back y'all messed up I decide not to do bad but then I uh then I do it anyway. My, next slide, y'all can go now, see y'all fall. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. You're not going to fix it until you look at the man or woman in the mirror. Me, myself, and I. Look at what Solomon said, a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. Y'all know some people like that. I hope it's not y'all, but y'all know some people like that. They will never take responsibility. And then if you try to tell them, hey, this is the problem, then now nah, they point the finger back to you. A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Just to make sure we all clean, just lift your hands and say, God, forgive me, God, forgive for, being me. for being me. I accept, I accept my another chance. I know that's not good English, but I couldn't say my second chance. Because some of us got our second chance seven years ago. We got another chance today. We're going to need another chance tomorrow, another chance Friday, another chance in August, another chance in 2020. This is amazing now. David said this, and this wasn't David, the little bitty boy that was fighting Goliath. This was grown David. That was the king. He was sitting on the throne and realized that there was still something inside of him that wasn't right. He's sitting on the throne and he has the responsibility of being king for everybody else, but he couldn't stand to look in the mirror at himself. Just because you're winning on the outside don't mean that you're at peace with yourself on the inside. That's why some of y'all better stop wishing you had other people's lives. I said it, I said it again. You want that Instagram feed, but you don't know they ain't slept in three days. You want their Facebook friends, but you don't know that they're burning candles in their house not to set the mood, but because they can't pay the light bill. Yes, sir. David had been sitting on the throne concealing his sins. Why? Because he felt that everybody else had developed a level that he was supposed to live up to. I'm coming against everybody that makes you feel like you need to live on a pedestal, but they can do whatever they want to do. 
You go to church. You shouldn't say that. You go to church. I say it because I know when I go to church, I can ask for forgiveness. And you better thank God I do go to church because you would have got more than that if I didn't. <laughs> so he's been sitting on the throne and he's miserable. Because he say, man, I got issues, but I, I can't tell nobody because you expect me to be perfect. And he thought that as he had to hide himself from other people, he also had to hide himself from God. And I need to tell you this today, man. God, God is such a loving God. Man, man. He ain't asking you to put on like you got to do for everybody else. You know how some people, you know, you see them and you know you're going to see them and you go all like. I'm saying you just don't let them see you any kind of way. Yeah. I don't let them bump into you at Walmart. <laughs> and you done messed around and, you know, ran out the house, had your bonnet on. You know, you wasn't prepared. You wasn't prepared. You running, you know. <laughs> and God say, I love you, bonnet and all. Touch your neighbor real quick, bonnet and all. <laughs> brothers, brothers, that, that muscle t-shirt when we ain't got no muscles, he love us. Shirt just hanging, ain't, ain't. <laughs> Confront it! <laughs> David said, what happened is for those whose guilt has been forgiven? What happened is for those whose guilt has been forgiven? What joys when sins are covered over? What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record? David said, man, there was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner I was. He said, but my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. All day and all night, your hand was heavy on me. And this is only people with relationships with God. I ain't trying to scare you away from a relationship with God, but I'm just telling you, if you have a relationship with God, there are certain things that he will do to you that don't happen to everybody else. You know, there's some stuff that other people are able to do and get away with. You think about it. It's because he's made such a, a valuable investment in you He's not going to let you mess it up. And he just on you all day. And he say, my strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you, to you, to you. Because some people, some people won't be able to appreciate what you got to say about you to them. I'm just be straight up, man. It might be somebody you rode in the car with the church. They may not be able to appreciate you saying, you know what, man, I'm going to be straight up, man. I, I got a problem with this. For real? They start looking at y'all funny. They shooting you the voicemail. They leaving you on red. And now you don't want to tell anybody. Let me tell you this. Talk to God. Because that's the place that you can be vulnerable. You can tell him the truth of the matter. You don't have to hide. Yes. Yes. All right. So now after you have made made the decision, you can keep going to the second point, after you made the decision to confront it, you know, you're not going to conceal it anymore, you're going to confront it. And God has forgiven you of that. God has forgiven you of that. When God forgives you, he takes it from you. He snatches it from you. He takes it from you. But what happens when I still have that desire, right? The second thing is, you have to starve your flesh and feed your soul. This is huge. Because what you feed the most is what's going to be the strongest. What's malnourished won't be able to stand. Look at what Paul said. 
He said, man, I find this to be a principle. When I want to do what's good, evil is right there with me, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my body a different principle waging war with the law in my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that exists in my body. Understands this. These, there are laws that are in place. And I know when we were kids, we didn't even know what was going on, but they were subliminally teaching us during Tom and Jerry that there is an evil side of you and there's an angelic side of you. Whichever one you feed the most is going to be the one that comes out the most. So if all you're doing is feeding it with mess and junk and garbage, that's what's going to come from you. If you're feeding it with holy things and things that are pure, things that are trustworthy, that's what's going to come out. That's why people walk to some of y'all and ask, how are you able to go through what you're going through and you haven't cracked? I have been feeding the right part of me. It's not that I'm special. I just have a special diet. Because I know if I don't create the right environment and if all I'm doing is listening to Nook If You Buck, You don't even have to knock. You can nudge. We're going down. But then, you know, that's why I have to have my balance, you know? Give me some gospel in. Give me some scriptures to make sure that when that person is out of their minds, I can stay in my right mind. That's why the Bible say, let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. He was nailed to a cross and didn't come down. He got spit on and didn't come down. They said crucify him and he didn't say, he said, Father, forgive them. I am, I'm a work in progress. That's Jesus, my name is Jamel. Some of the people he fed is the people that said crucify him. I would, oh, this how y'all go at? Kill them all, God! Kill them all! <laughs> Look at what Paul said. If you plant in the soil of your corrupt nature, you will harvest destruction. But if you plant in the soil of your spiritual nature, you will harvest everlasting life. Why is that important? It's because Paul is identifying that each one of us have two flower beds. You have soil of corruptness and then you have soil of spiritual nature but you are inclined to go to your soil of corruptness because you were born in sin and shaped in iniquity so you have to do even more for there to be a balance between the two so how do I offset that the first thing that you have to do you got to come to church oh Pastor Jay, you over your time. I know, and? <laughs> come to church. Touch your name and say, come to church. Come to church. Come to church. Come to church. We Christians. What you do on Sunday? Ain't time to play pinochle. We come to church. Play dominoes after the service. We come to church. Why is it so important? The Hebrew writer said, don't stop meeting together with other believers, which some of you have gotten into the habit of doing. He said, back then, they had already started to stop coming to church. And he said, because when you come to church, you're able to encourage each other, especially as you see the day drawing near. There was an old seminary speaker, a seminary teacher. He said this. He said, when we come to church, we have fellowship. And he said, the fellowship is not just fellowship like communion, where I get to shake your hand, I hug you on the way out. Fellowship is meaning that you ain't the only fellow on the ship. Who like Brandy sitting up in my room? You in your room, you going crazy. You thinking that your children are the only little gremlins that's walking around, they tan up stuff. Like, Lord, what did I do to deserve this? Then you come and I introduce you to Jalen and Adonis, and you like, hey, if the pastor kid's crazy, mine okay. <laughs> Your kids want to come to church too. Don't get into your rut and you in your bed not wanting to come out and you leaving them to now not be armed with what they need. Do you know it's little satanic kids at school? 
they need to be able to be on with some scripture themselves. Come to church and stay in your word. Boy, if I can get y'all to read y'all Bible the way y'all check them timelines, if I can get y'all to read y'all Bible like y'all be on Instagram, I'm going to see if the Bible app will let y'all put some selfies in there. Maybe I can get y'all to get in that in. what David said. He said, I treasure your word above all else. It keeps me from sinning against you. Have you ever been on the edge and you was about to do something you weren't supposed to do? I know where your mind went. I ain't even talking about that. Talking about y'all that like going in that self-checkout in Walmart. Just so happen not to scan a couple of things. It was a scripture. Lord tried to talk to you. You acting all crazy, huh? What? That's God. But if you haven't been starving your flesh, you're going to think it was well, a come up. You got a whole big screen TV and you're scanning summer sausage, saltine crackers, and grape juice. It's, important to starve your flesh and feed your soul you must watch the company that you keep touch your neighbor real quick say he talking to you (laughs) watch the company that you keep Paul the same dude he says here to a whole different church he said don't let anyone deceive you associating with bad people will ruin decent people have you ever been around somebody that every time you talk to them, there's always something going wrong, nothing ever is right in their life, and then you get off the phone with them, you down, you just, well, I just got a promotion. Why I'm feeling like this? They ruin you. Somebody in here hooked on something that you never would be hooked on if you wasn't introduced to it by somebody that you trust. Amen. This is my last point, y'all. Dealing with the inner me, that's my enemy. I must remember Jesus got me. Yeah. The Bible said, while we were yet sinners, he died for us, which means that he knew this day was going to come. He knew there would be a time that you would be battling yourself. That's why Paul could look in the eighth chapter and say, nothing can separate me from the love of God. It's because Jesus had to remind him, I knew you were going to do it. I didn't die for your perfect self. I died for your work in progress. And I died so you could keep working and keep making progress. See, that's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants that one decision to make you feel so guilty that you don't want to do nothing else the next day. Remember that time you felt all good? You were reading your Bible, you were praying. One mistake. Now you feel guilty. You don't even want to open your Bible no more. You don't even want to pray. Like God that mad at you, he don't want you to read his Bible? That's the time he wants you now. He wants you even closer now because he needs to heal you through this. He needs to show you the lesson to learn from this. Remember, Jesus got you. Look at what Paul said. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? He said the answer, thank God, is that Jesus can and does. What is the answer? Is there anyone who can do anything for me? Excuse me, the question was, is there anyone who can do anything for me? And the answer is, yes, Jesus can do anything, and he does do anything. See, that person that you're sitting next to, that it that you're confronting, they may not have that problem. But everybody in here has something that's keeping us from being the perfect image of God. Because when he created us, he created us in his image and likeness. 
So when we walk by a mirror, we should look like him and not like it. We have a high priest. His name is Jesus. And the scripture here says, let us hold firmly to what we believe. That this high priest of ours understands our weakness. He was faced with all the same things we did, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. See, that's where our help is. And the enemy just wants to keep you from God. You may not receive mercy from anybody else, but you'll receive mercy from God. They may not forgive you, but God will give you forgiveness. And because he does it, this is the thing that I need you to get. Because he has forgiven you, he's now asking you to forgive yourself. It's the same grace that Paul got when he had a thorn in his flesh and he needed it to go. And God said, nah, man, my grace is all you need. For my power is greatest when you are weak. See, he's not holding that you messed up against you. He's just hurt that after you mess up, you won't fess up so he can help you get up. What an amazing experience we just had at the Word Church. I'm so excited that God has allowed us the opportunity to bring the Word to you wherever you are. We have people that watch us all across the globe, and I'm thankful that we have come to you. I'm asking you to do one of three things. The first thing that I want you to do is share this message with somebody else. We never know. The people that we are in contact with may be one word away from their life shifting. Share it with them today. This could be the word that saves their life. The second thing that I want you to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel to make sure that the next time that a word comes from the word church, you're the first to know. And lastly, if you're in the city of Houston or surrounding areas, make sure to visit us at TWC. It is an experience that you have to experience yourself to believe it. All right. Well, I pray that the word of God that you heard today blesses you beyond measure. Take this with you, apply it in your life, and be all that God has called you to be. God bless you.